my god. Oh, it is a hot, sticky, miserable yuck. Oh, sweaty day. Here in the end times and the collapse of everything. Where this is the hottest day I have had. I guess in three years, maybe, it's the hottest day I have had. Yeah, one of the hottest days I have ever spent at Bugs in a Jar Farm outside of Ithaca, New York, here on this uh, hot, sweaty, sticky. Uh, it is a Tuesday afternoon, June 18th, 2024. And uh, so I think I've read stuff from this fellow before here on uh, medium.com this fellow named Steve it's either Genco or Genco G-E-N-C-O uh, Steve uh, we're gonna we'll just call him Steve that Steve I don't think would deny the fact that he is an apocaloptimist he is not a clue, clueless moron the man I uh, completely understands well, I think he understands how fucked we are, uh, but of course uh, he thinks at least a few of us are going to come out the other side of the bottleneck and carry on the human race. Uh, I guess he considers that a noble pursuit to, uh, to come out the other side of the bottleneck. But he decidedly is not a doomer. <coughs> so we're going to meet in the middle. The doomers and the apocalyptimists are meeting in the middle with Steve's newest essay, this book link essay, which I'm just going to read one section out of, titled, What Are We Talking About When We Talk About Collapse? What are we talking about when we talk about collapse? So, according to Steve, this is what we're talking about. <clears throat> when it comes to writing about climate change or energy transition or resource depletion, the new it word seems to be collapse. Collapse is everywhere. But, Collapse is an inherently fuzzy concept. We are often assured that it will not happen all at once, like in the movie The Day After Tomorrow. But beyond that, we find very little guidance as to precisely how it might play out over a longer stretch of time. All that most people seem to agree on is this. <clears throat> it is going to be really, really bad. So I'm assuming that Steve is putting himself, and I think he is a breeder and possibly and probably a grandfather, uh, so I'm assuming that Steve is including himself as being in agreement that it's going to be really, really bad. One school of thought which I have called End times doomism. End times doomism tells us there is no need to worry because we, many humans, lack agency to do anything about it. We are as powerless as a bunch of ants on a log floating down a river caught in its current heading toward a waterfall we cannot avoid. So, we might as well embrace radical acceptance and enjoy the ride, if not the destination. Thank you very much. That is uh, a very well, a, a very good description of end times doomers embracing radical acceptance, which uh, obviously Steve has no interest in embracing. <clears throat> For those of us who choose to believe in, in what you believe about where this planet is going, uh, according to Steve, and uh, 
you know, is a choice. Uh, it, it, it's a choice. You can read all the science that's available to end times doomers and apocalyptimists alike. You can look at all of the mounting information. You can walk out to the hottest day you have had in three years, and you can choose whether to believe whether we're fucked or not. So, <clears throat> getting to back to Steve, for those of us who choose to believe that life after collapse is both possible and likely, radical acceptance will not do. I want to be explicit about why. It is because whatever world we find ourselves in during and after collapse, we will aspire to be among its survivors. Uh, I just have to break in, uh, you know, with one of my favorite quotes from my late great radical acceptance doomer and Airbnb host uh, Gail Zawacki, uh, the late great Gail who assured me when I had the pleasure of interviewing her here at Collapse Chronicles a few years ago, uh, was saying, you know, she's not pretending like she knows when Collapse is going to get here or what exactly it's going to look like but she can assure you that she, she goes, I don't want to be here when this whole shit show comes down, and I can assure you, neither do you. And uh, Gail got out of here before the screen door hit her too hard on her own guilty ass on her way out. But uh, it, 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 anyway, I just... Uh, had to give a nod to Gail's, uh, Gail Zawacki's view of the situation before heading on. Okay. So this is for people not like Gail Zawacki who do want to uh, come out the other side of collapse. As individuals, we may not be able to save modern civilization as a whole from its self-inflicted death spiral, and that is a good thing, of course, but each of us will want to save ourselves and those we love, especially our children and grandchildren who did not ask to be born into this damaged world, we, meaning breeders, have created for them. Exactly that sentence is in boldface uh, as it should be and this is this is just my fundamental misunderstanding about doomers so Steve I, I, I mean apocalyptimist breeders so Steve understands that we and mostly meaning breeders uh, have damaged the world I would say beyond repair and these kids that these breeders are, are keep bringing onto this planet did not ask to be born uh, onto this shithole planet. This is why I say bringing, if, if you are at all aware of the situation on this planet and, and making the voluntary decision to bring a child onto this planet in the year 2024, it is child abuse. It is child abuse and it's planet abuse. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, he's obviously not talking to me. Uh, I, I, ha I will not uh, have any concern about saving my children and grandchildren because I did not have any. Anyway, so each of us will inevitably ask, how can I best navigate the next several decades of uncertainty, crisis, and collapse in order to maximize my own and my family's chances of survival? 
My personal view is that human beings might intellectually embrace the idea of radical acceptance, but few of the of us accepting the sociopaths in our midst would be willing and able to lean over and tell our three-year-old granddaughter to do the same. Uh, I, I, anyway, uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not even gonna go there. Okay. Uh, if you want to be among those who survive collapse, you need to understand collapse. So here are the main things you need to un understand. According to Steve Janko, the first thing you need to understand is that collapse of civilization happens in waves. Next, you need to understand how each wave, you know, of collapse is likely to play out. You need to be aware of the early warning signs of sequential collapse within each wave so you can identify where you are in the unfolding flow of events. And finally, you need to be able to assess how the damage you are observing, including damage at global, national, regional, and local levels, is likely to impact what you should do next. Armed with this information, you can start making some strategic personal decisions. What goals to pursue? What skills to acquire? What assets to keep? What communities to join? And of course, the hardest one of all, what people to trust? And, uh... So then he dives into the meat of the discussion where he breaks down the four waves of civilization collapse. Uh, our global civilization is already in collapse. It is just that the first wave of collapse we are experiencing right now is happening very unevenly around the planet so many of us are not fully aware of the devastation already occurring, but many others are in the thick of it. Just not everywhere, not yet. And uh, so then he breaks down the four waves of collapse, starting with environmental collapse, the first wave of civilization collapses, environmental, and it is happening faster, it is fair to say, than anyone expected. And he breaks all that down. Then the probably half of the article is, uh, is on economic collapse. The second wave of civilization collapse is economic. The extent of economic collapse and its severity will be determined by two driving forces. The ferocity and geographic reach of climate change disasters and the phasing out of fossil fuels. And then he uh, takes a deep dive into all of that, which I don't have time to get into. And if you, you really should uh, subscribe to medium.com if you're not, because there really is the most intelligent discussion of collapses anywhere I've found. Uh, then, of course, all that is going to lead into political collapse. Uh, interestingly, he never mentions societal collapse. He has environmental, economic, and political never mentioning societal collapse. I guess that's just kind of uh, societal collapse. I'm assuming Steve just 
figures we understand that is implicit in all these other ones. But the one I want to talk about, because of course it is my favorite, and uh, dream, 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 population collapse. Population collapse, and this is what I find to be, obviously, since I am a huge fan of the collapse of the human population from 8 billion down to zero, I am a huge fan of voluntary human extinction, and I'm getting to be a bigger and bigger fan every day of involuntary human extinction. Uh, this is the part that I want to... Uh, to share with you and you can read the rest of the article for yourself. So take it away. <coughs> Once I get my collapsed trachea back in working order. Uh, so this is the view of population collapse from an apocalyptimist, I'm thinking boomer breeder who desires to come through the bottleneck. So this is not Sam Mitchell saying this. I just think that uh, this is an intelligent discussion even though I don't agree with a lot of it, although I do agree with a lot of it. All right. The fourth wave of civilization collapse is population collapse. When commentators talk about civilization collapse, they usually mean human extinction or at best a steep decline in human population. <clears throat> but population collapse does not just happen if such a catastrophe, and, and I consider the, a population collapse to be the absolute antithesis of a catastrophe. The catastrophe on the planet is not having a population collapse. We are in a catastrophe until we do have a population collapse, preferably down to zero, but at least down to the 500 million on the Georgia Guide signs. But anyway, Steve Jenko considers the collapse of human population to be a catastrophe for some reason I'm not clear of. If such a catastrophe is in our future, and it is, we will see it coming long before it arrives because we will first have to pass through the three waves of destruction reviewed above, environmental poisoning followed by economic stagnation followed by political collapse. There you go. I agree with everything in that. And, and why would anybody who sees all of that coming have any desire, A, to live through it themselves and more shockingly, to with this knowledge of how fucked we are, to bring another human being onto this planet when you understand where this planet is heading. It, it, it is a complete, total mystery to me. Back to see. As I have reported before, we are at a disadvantage when it comes to anticipating the impact of climate change and energy descent on human populations because most of the climate models we use to investigate possible future scenarios treat population size as a source of climate change, which is exactly what it is. It is the underlying source of climate change. Zero humans, zero anthropogenic climate change. And everything else that's anthropogenic. Uh, so, we treat uh, population size correctly 
as a source of climate change and resource depletion, but fail to include it as an effect of those same developments. Uh, well, some of us do. Uh, anybody who understands the overshoot understands that what goes up must come down. This is why today's climate models don't show population declines in the face of unprecedented global warming. They don't include population as an output variable in their models. If they did, they would probably find that world and regional population projections based solely on birth and death rates, such as those recently produced by the UN's population division, division are wildly over-optimistic or pessimistic, depending on your worldview, for the hotter world we are entering. And, and you know, and exactly, I, you know, I don't agree with the word over-optimistic. I would change it to over-pessimistic. But to this day, the UN is just using present day uh, birth and more importantly, present day death rates. When they're talking about where the population is going to be in 2050, 2070, and 2100, they're basing it on today's birth and death rates and trying to extrapolating those out into the future which is absurd. The bottleneck, they're, 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 they're these population estimates, uh, I, I mean, they, they are going to be correct uh, right up to a point. And of course, the whole discussion is when we hit the bottleneck, it's going to be a hell of a lot sooner than the UN predicts, but it's going to be a hell of a lot later than those uh, uh, near-term human extinction idiots are talking about. What we do know is that humans need three things to survive on this planet. Breathable air, drinkable water, and edible food. If any individual human is denied minimal amounts of any of these basic ingredients of life, that human dies. The question of population collapse essentially comes down to this. Given the environmental damage we, meaning humans, continue to inflict on the planet's atmosphere, arable lands, oceans, and freshwater resource, given the likely breakdown of the economic systems by which we produce and distribute food and goods around the world, and given the coming energy descent that will leave governments unable to maintain order among their increasingly fractious citizens, how many mouths can this new damaged world feed, and where are those lucky survivors likely to be located? Lucky survivors. You know, again, I am with Gail Zawacki. There is nothing lucky about being a survivor of this collapse. You do not want to be here. There, 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 there is nothing to recommend living in a post-collapse society lucky survivors. The survivors of this shit are the most unlucky human beings on the planet. But anyway, other than that, I'm, uh, you know, except for a few words, I'm in complete agreement with Steve. An environment's carrying capacity is defined by ecologists as the maximum number of individuals that an environment can support sustainably at a given level of activity. Sustainability means the environment can support the population indefinitely. 
the resources it provides that maintain the population can be replenished faster than the population can consume them. If the population is the population is larger than the environment's carrying capacity, it will consume the environment's resources faster than they can be replenished, producing a condition ecologists or anyone with a brain call overshoot. A population in overshoot is, by definition, unsustainable. It may manage to increase its carrying capacity to support larger populations. Perhaps the best example of this is the Green Revolution of the 1970s, but eventually, when carrying capacity has been maximized as far as it can go, or when carrying capacity has been artificially diminished due to environmental degradation and or overconsumption, there is only one way to correct overshoot. Shrink the population back to a level its environment can support sustainably. So here is a man, again, and I'm not picking on just on Steve because there's a lot of people who share this man's view. He, so Steve understands there is only one way to correct overshoot. Shrink the population back to a level its environment can support sustainably and yet they continue to support bringing more children onto this planet. Again, I am flummoxed, I am gobsmacked how anybody this intelligent could still be supporting people having children. For humans, the Earth's carrying capacity has many components, but chief among them is global food supply. Currently, we are told humanity produces enough food to feed 10 billion people. The number the UN ignoring potential climate related impacts on mortality or as Tennessee Jed would say nuclear war impacts on, uh, uh, on uh, mortality expects to be alive in 2050. But we also know that much of that capacity is either, the, the food uh, capacity is either wasted or never reaches the mouths of humans. As a result, a world of relative food abundance, global relief organization, as a result, in a world of relative food abundance, global relief, organizations estimate that a billion people today uh, do not have enough to eat and perhaps 2.4 billion more people live in circumstances of food insecurity, a condition defined by the UN as, quote, a lack of regular access to enough safe and nutritional food for normal growth and development in an active and healthy life, close quote. That means about 40% of the 8 billion people alive today are already struggling to feed themselves. This certainly sounds like more reasons to bring more people onto a planet. If that is the state of the food supply today, Consider what, what impact these projections included in the IPCC's 2022 six assessment report will have on food supply and human mortality over the uh, the next several decades. Uh, and uh, I can see that uh, this is taking a whole lot longer 
to uh, read uh, that I started with in between my trachea collapsing and the batteries on this. I really wish I could go with this, but, but Steve Jenko ha has done his work and then so but what he does is he breaks down all of the reasons uh, why uh, the, the, the population of humans is going to crash and burn uh, and then uh, then he talks about how the IPCC uh, even with their gloomy outlook is uh, is, com is way conservative uh, so when we can connect the dots ourselves and when we do we cannot avoid the unstated conclusion what what we have done to this planet meaning what humans have done to this planet how we have done it why we are still doing it we are going to kill a lot of people and uh, then uh, and then he keeps and then he starts looking at what is a sustainable world population he gets into all of that uh, and I'm telling you, this is a small part of this article. Uh, he looks at all that. All right, he quotes William Reese. This is William Reese weighing in on it. Quote, the long-term human carrying capacity of, of Earth after, after ecosystems have recovered from the current plague plague phase is a term used by ecologists to describe the peak of a population boom bust cycle is probably one to three billion people depending on technology and material standards of living uh, and then I got all Johan Rockstrom Quote, if global warming is not in any way mitigated and we go into a six or eight degree Fahrenheit warmer world, then our planet will probably only be able to support one billion people. Uh, And then he talks about all of this shit about uh, declining birth rates gets in of uh, anyway let's get to the bottom paragraph on population decline population collapse whether we shrink the human footprint on this planet gradually through declining fertility precipitously through carrying capacity collapse or most likely through a combination of the two the world our descendants will inherit at the end of this century will be vastly different from the one we enjoy today fewer people less energy smaller settlements, economic stagnation, huge abandoned wastelands, and wild, wild weather. I suspect our descendants will do what humans have always done. They will observe, they will learn, they will rebuild, and they will carry on as best they can and then uh, okay then he ends this uh, missive with this paragraph 
we should not be deceived by the siren song of radical acceptance. Everything that happens to humanity from here on will be a function of free choices. Of free choices we have made and will make. We may be ants on a log unable to avoid the waterfall ahead, but if we are smart, if we are smart, we may be able to survive the fall and rebuild something last lasting, if more humble, in its wake. And uh, you can imagine there's what this fellow, uh, Sam Mitchell, uh, from Collapse Chronicles, had to say about this article. I must say, this is Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles weighing in on this missive. I must say that this essay has managed to spell out the reasons for being a radical acceptance doomer than any essay I have ever read written by a radical acceptance doomer. This essay should be required reading for every high schooler on the planet so they can begin to radically accept that we are doomed, as the article illustrates, and use that agency to keep their peckers in their pants and to not let their knickers down, which is the core reason that this planet is an overshoot. Steve Jenko is an intelligent man. He knows as well as any doomer that his list of what we need to do to voluntarily create a sustainable civilization ain't gonna happen, period. So any collapse denier out there should start radically accepting that fact and get out there and enjoy it while they still can. And this was uh, Steve Jenko's response to Sam Mitchell. Thanks for weighing in, Sam. Your response is a valid one. Of course you know it's the opposite of what I was trying to say. Oh well, if my collapse scenario reinforces your doomer radical acceptance perspective, what can I say? I would offer a small quibble on your suggestion that my story is about what we need to do voluntarily, need to do to voluntarily create a sustainable civilization. None of it is about a voluntary path to sustainability that is the domain of the voluntary degrowth uh, movement, uh, and, and, and even Steve Jenko knows the voluntary degrowth movement ain't gonna happen. And I have written extensively about how we are unlikely to adopt any of that until the pain gets much worse. No, this scenario is about what we will actually do. What will essentially, we will essentially be forced to do as we are confronted by each of these waves of collapse. I still don't like the concept of radical acceptance. It is clear people define this differently but ultimately, I think it, it is an excuse for passivity, and I find that unacceptable. I can accept doom as a possible outcome, but not as a certain one, and I think radical acceptance 
is a self-fulfilling prophecy that will result in more death and destruction, not less, in my humble opinion. So, uh, there we go. The debate is alive and well between the uh, apocalyptimists and the radical acceptance doomers. Uh, you will find it all on medium.com, but uh, at least we can take a breather from the complete clueless morons who haven't even gotten to the apocalyptimist phase of their doomer evolution. So uh, I need to see if I've been talking to myself to a dead battery for the last 20 minutes and then uh, head out there to rape the scum out of my pond while I still can. My guys. I don't believe it. It is still going on. 41 minutes we are hanging out up at Seahorse in the Pines to escape the heat while we still can. My guys.